Hello and welcome, my merry band of fellow OSATers, to this, the 55th episode of the Sockmetician podcast. My name is Nathan Taylor, also known as Sockmetician, right here on YouTube, also on Ravelry, Instagram and Twitter. I don't even know where to begin. It's been a few weeks since I last did a podcast, and I make no apologies for that. I've been a very, very busy boy, and I've been jet-setting around the world. Namely, as the name of this podcast suggests, going to New York to go to Rhinebeck. Now, I'm very aware that some people, some people who can't go to places like Rhinebeck or to Edinburgh and things like that, get a little bit fed up with people chatting on about it. Well, listen, don't. The reason why we chat on about it is because these things are part of the knitting world. They're part of the knitting community. And there's no point sitting at home being bitter about it. If you can't afford it, that's fine. We all have uh, different problems with, with finances and stuff like that. I am glad that somebody has gone who can show me all the wonderful things so that I can share in it too. And that is what I'm going to do today. So I am... Delighted to be able to bring you my Rhinebeck Roundup. Normally, as you all know, I start this podcast with my Roundup. I'm actually not going to do that. I'm going to do that a little bit further on into the, into the podcast and mix things up a bit because this is mostly all about Rhinebeck. So if I'm going to get this Roundup out of the way first... Doesn't end with anything else to chat about. Welcome to anyone who is a new viewer. Uh, I come to you from North London. If things look a little bit different on the colour and uh, atmosphere of this podcast, that's because I'm going to have to experiment a little bit with new lighting states. Um, I am filming this on my brand new iPhone 8, and it has a very different camera, and it's behaving very differently. So what I'm seeing on screen is not what I'm used to. It all looks uh, a little bit darker and a little more orange. Um, So I don't know if that's just how my screen is rendering it or whether this will be what you'll see on YouTube. So bear with me, this is a work in progress, just like life. So where to begin? I'm gonna dive straight into the community aspect of this podcast and uh, and I'm gonna go on with uh, podcast questions. Now there's not very many, There is quite a lot of chatter on the podcast questions thread. Please, 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 no chatter. No chatter, no chatter, no chatter. If you're responding to something that someone has said, something that somebody has said on the podcast questions thread, ear burn them from the general chatter thread, please. It just makes my admin life so tricky if I'm having to wade through uh, the lovely things that you're all saying to each other. And don't get me wrong, I adore it. But I have said this before. Please, 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 please. If you care about me at all, chat in the chatter. Ask questions to me in the podcast thread. That would be amazing. Thank you very much. So in terms of what we have got, um, not a great deal, I think. Uh, it's just to Paula. Now, Paula and I had the great uh, pleasure of uh, spending three hours in each other's company in Rhinebeck. She took one of my classes. Hi, Paula. How are you? Um, and she's catching up on earlier episodes. Hi, Nathan, she says. I'm catching up with your earlier episodes in a rather random fashion. I'm on 19 now. Now, this was about a month ago, so you are probably past that. And you mentioned your friend James, whose knitting technique seems to defy explanation. You said you're sorry you didn't video his method and plan to ask him to provide video proof. Did that ever happen? Like you, I'm fascinated with the mechanics of knitting, mine and everyone else's, so could you lean on James to show us this mystery? Well, next time I see James, I will certainly try to do that, but James now lives up in Shetland, and I live in North London, which is a long way south of Shetland, even though it's North London. I guess South London will be further away, but it's still a long way away. So, uh, no. I'm sorry, Paula, I haven't. Paula then goes on to say, going back all the way to episode 24, you showed your lonely, your lonely Lorelei sock and I fell in love with it. Thank you. You said back then you might reverse engineer it and create the pattern for release if there was enough interest. I think you should work out the pattern, Nathan. That is one gorgeous sock and I do mean one. Yes, there is only one. Uh, it would be quite simple to go back and, and redo it. I just don't have the time at the moment. There's, um, I'm a busy boy. 
there's a lot of things going on, a lot of things coming up over the next few, the next couple of months really. So pretty much to the end of the year, I'm chock-a-block and booked solid. And having had a week away, I'm a little bit uh, nervous about trying to fit in everything I've got to do. Certainly between now and the end of February, I've got a lot on, uh, a lot of deadlines to hit, one of which has recently whizzed past me and I still haven't found the time to finish what I'm supposed to be doing for it, but it's all okay. I had a little extension on it and it's all good. But being away for a week has kind of slowed things down a little bit. Not saying I begrudge going. I had an amazing time, but that's kind of that. And I think, <coughs> I think everything else in here is, is uh, the, the babble of chatter. Uh, oh, no, I, I lie. Uh, Kristen Liu says, uh, Hi, I was just curious if Ben showed any further interest in crocheting. Well, Ben showed a lot of interest in never crocheting again. <laughs> I don't think that's going to change any time soon. Any time soon at all. Not going to be able to make a crochet out of my husband. Just going to uh, polish the lens of my camera a bit, if you don't mind. Sorry about this. I'm going to pause it right here and I'll edit this bit out. I think it's a bit blurry. I suspect that's a lot better. That seems to have got rid of this flaring here. I ain't going to go back and redo that again. You know me, lazy podcaster. Not enough time in my day. <laughs> and then finally, Sarah Jo, or maybe it's Sarah Jo. I do know Sarah's and Sarah's that spell their name S-A-R-A. Says, I was wondering what status the Genesis shawl pattern release is. You're not alone, Sarah Jo. Is there any chance that you'll partner with someone else and release a kit? I don't think so. I am so smitten with Il Barato and would like something equally wonderful to knit. I'm enjoying your podcast immensely. Your wit, charm and delivery are as addictive as the contents. Well, thank you very much indeed. Um, so, in terms of Genesis, Genesis, for those of you who don't know, is the large orange and green shawl that I wear to every festival I go to. It's become my, my, my show shawl, if you like, my festival uniform. And I love it. Um, and it's a big, big pattern. You all know this. This is... It's the pattern that I named the very first episode of this podcast after. <clears throat> and in America, at Rhinebeck, a lot of people showed interest in it. And it has sort of spurred me on to thinking I really need to get on with it uh, sometime soon. And it's at a stage which is kind of almost there. Most of the work has been done. There's still a lot of time to spend on it. So I don't know if I'll get around to it before the end of this year, but it is something that I'm definitely keen to do. Now that, now that I know that, well, several things really, now that I know that there's more interest in that specific pattern, which is great, but I was always a little bit worried thinking, uh, there's not that many double knitters out there and this is a mammoth piece. So is it going to be worthwhile doing it? And I think it will be, I think, the more people I teach, the more people, more double knitters there are out there who will have the skills and the, the inclination to want to do something like uh, Genesis, because it's, it's, it's big, you know, it's big. So uh, that's kind of that. Um, yes, the answer is I haven't done anything more on it, but uh, I plan to. I say watch this space, but don't hold your breath. <laughs> Maybe that's the safest way of looking at it. So, uh, yeah, I'm, this is a very sort of odd angle I'm seeing. Everything looks a little bit more, there's more in my field of vision. Perhaps it's a wider angle lens than I'm used to seeing, because I don't know if you normally see this plate here. I know people are familiar with this one, but uh, I don't know. Maybe it just looks different because the colours are different. I don't know. So that's kind of that. And now I want to get on with my story to, uh, my, of my trip to New York because that's kind of why you're here, right? It didn't go very well to begin with. Some of you who follow me on Instagram will be aware that I posted <coughs> a sad looking picture of myself as I was on the plane on the way to New York. Now, normally, I would be very excited and very happy to be going to New York. New York is my favourite city in the world. I've got so many friends there. I always have an amazing, amazing time. And I should be very excited and happy to be going. Under normal circumstances, I absolutely would be. This particular time was a little bit different. Yes, of course, I was looking forward to getting to New York. And yes, of course, I was doubly excited about going to Rhinebeck as well. But, okay, backtrack.
That's really weird. When I hold my nose, the lighting changes. Can you see that happening when I release it? It does it. I don't know what that is. Maybe this camera is a little bit hypersensitive to changes in. Oh, look at that. Yeah, I put my hand over my face and the lighting changes. Maybe it's something to do with my beard. No? It's definitely my face. <laughs> you and I, dear Osata, will have to go on this journey of discovery together as I, as I get more used to how this phone works and what I need to do and say with it. Is that okay? <laughs> it's changing all the time. I don't know. So, uh, the night before I set off for the airport, I was... I was flying at 12.30, just after midday, so I had to get there about 10.30, and there was plenty of time for me to do that. I decided, because I wanted to save some money, precious irony, about which more in a moment, uh, uh, that I wouldn't get the uh, Heathrow Express, which is £20 or something like that, uh, and I wouldn't get a cab, which would cost me £30. I'd go on the underground, which I can do all the way to Heathrow, to the terminal that I was flying from, and uh, from my house, because Highgate Tube Station is literally just out there. And, uh, and it would cost me about four pounds. Great. So I set off in plenty of time. Um, I got to the airport. I had checked in online beforehand this morning, that morning, so all was good. I was in the queue for the bag drop, ready to relieve myself of my suitcase and as I was standing there I put my hand in my pocket in my, the pocket of my rucksack to pull out my passport it wasn't there I'm smiling now but it's through gritted teeth the gritted teeth of pain trauma and sorrow <sighs> what I had done I had uh, this is so painful to even relive it. What I had done was this. I had put out all my paperwork and everything the night before. Uh, I hadn't packed in a suitcase because I hadn't got my clothes ready and stuff. I was going to do that in the morning, which I did. And as I was packing everything, I picked up my passport to put in my bag. And while I had it in my hand, I thought, oh, I must go to my computer and check in online. I did that. And I left the passport next to the computer and left the house. So I phoned Ben and he had been away that night but he was now back and he was on his way to a studio where he was recording the cast recording for his new musical M which was done back in June you'll remember me talking about that then if you're a regular podcast watcher uh, that's all coming together very nicely by the way so hopefully there'll be something that I can share very soon um, and uh, he said well I'm, I'm close to home I can turn around and go back and I can go and get it I said, yeah, but you can't come all the way to Heathrow. I said, I'm in an Uber already. How about we try and rendezvous halfway, which will save me having to come all the way back to Highgate to then uh, go back again. And there's a chance I might be able to, to get the flight. So I'd, I'd said to the lady, I said, I, I, I still had to queue. And I said, I've, I've, lost my, I've left my passport at home. I know where it is. Can I check my bag in at least? She said, not without a passport. So I knew that when I got back, I'd have to go through the process of checking my bag in. At least if I could have done it, I could have like arrived and pegged it straight through security, but <clears throat> not to be. So I got in an Uber and Ben, uh, we, met, we sort of had this kind of two-way conversation. Uh, can you get to such and such? Oh, I, uh, yeah, I've just passed that. Okay, we'll keep going because we're not there yet. Oh, we'll meet you at so-and-so. <clears throat> and it became uh, ridiculous. When we did finally meet, Ben got to the rendezvous point slightly ahead of me, so he got out of the car uh, and came to the pavement and uh, to the side of the curb and had my passport in his hand. And our cab, my cab, cab driver was brilliant, we didn't even stop. He uh, was driving along, I wound the window down, and as we passed by, I grabbed the passport. <laughs> and waved and thank you so much, bye bye! Oh, it was ridiculous. <clears throat> and he hammered it back to Heathrow Airport to see if I could get to the plane in time, and no. Gallingly, the plane was still on the tarmac, and I still had half an hour before it took off, but it, the gate was closed, they wouldn't let me on, so... So I had to buy another, well, I had to pay £150 to change my flight to one that was five hours later than mine should have done, and it should have changed anyway, uh, should have flown anyway. Um, 
This is so funny. There's a siren there. As, as I'm sure many of you are aware, I live on a busy main road and it's London, so there's lots of sirens. The amount of times people have said to me, who've, who I met at Rhinebeck, have said, oh, the sirens at your house. So I didn't realise quite what a feature of my podcast the sirens are. They're, they're clearly something that you think I live with all the time. I never notice them, except when I'm recording this. Anyway. Uh, so £150 to change the ticket and uh, £50 in the Uber. So it was a £200 error. And five hours later, not to mention while I was sitting in the lounge waiting to depart, uh, I mean, not one of the special lounges, just the bit where all the boards give all the flight details information, uh, the fire alarms went off and we all had to evacuate the terminal. I was like, something is telling me I'm never going to get to Rhinebeck. I'm determined to make it happen. I had classes to give. I had people I could not afford to disappoint. Anyway, I got there. I spent the first two days uh, with my dear, dear friends, Ian and Jem. Ian and Jem are wonderful, wonderful singers and wonderful friends. And Ian is American. He lives in New York. They're now together. But Jem is from Australia. But they used to live here. And we used to do a lot of singing and stuff together. We, we put a cabaret act together, the three of us. Um, and very, very close to them. And it was lovely, lovely to spend time with them in their lovely house out in Queens. Um, while I was there... So this is not the Rhinebeck, Rhinebeck Roundup. This is still kind of the preliminary stuff. We'll move on to that in a second. While I was there... Uh, I got some new ink done. So this leads me on right away to talking about my uh, very special extra edition of What's That? Some of you eagle-eyed people may have noticed that while I've been doing all this kind of stuff, there's not only the ink on this arm, but there's also something dark and scary on this arm too. Well, that's the new tattoo. Do you want to see it? Well, you're going to have to wait. I had been looking at getting a... Getting a tattoo while I was in New York, specifically. I think there's a different style of tattoos that's happening in America from the ones that we have over here. We tend to be quite old school in, in style. Good tattoos, but not the kind of thing that I'm looking for. In America, there's more like the, the trash polka and various other styles of things. The very, very fine lines, very minimalist tattoos, which are happening. And I like that watercolour tattoos are a big thing over there. They're not really here yet. So I wanted to add elements of that. I also knew that going to Rhinebeck was going to be a quite a big deal. Um, and for many reasons, this year has been one of, of big change for me. Uh, so I wanted to mark all of that by getting a tattoo done in New York. So I've been doing lots of research. <clears throat> just before I started recording this, excuse me for coughing, I had a massive coughing fit. I just sort of choked on some water and then, yeah. So I'm recovering from that. Um, but I've done a lot of research into the kind of tattoo artists in Brooklyn and in Manhattan. Um, <clears throat> and I'd had communication with several for which for various reasons had fallen through but there was one young lady that I found I didn't know where she was I know she worked sometimes out of a shop in Manhattan um, but uh, it turns out that I didn't go there to see her um, I think she has several places that she visits it's a Japanese girl called Miko and her fine line work is really is really very good uh, so I thought, well, I'll, I mean, it's, it's because a couple of other things had fallen through, it was getting quite close. And I thought, well, there's not many people who are going to have time this close to be able to sort me out for the, the one day in my trip to New York that I had time to get my, my, the work done. So I emailed her out of the blue and she said, yes, so yes, I'm available. What did you have in mind? I was like, great. And I explained what I wanted. Is this the kind of thing you can do? And she said, yes, lovely. Let's make it happen. I paid a deposit and there it was. And we, we was all ready to go. So, I asked her where she was. I'm not going to show it to you yet. You're going to have to wait a little bit longer for that. You know how this works. I'm spinning this out very deliberately. <laughs> so, uh, I said to her, where, where, are you, where do you operate from? And she said, I work in Flushing in Queens. Is it possible for you to get out there? And when I looked on the map, it just so happens that Flushing Main Street, which is the end of the, the line on the 7 train for the whole uh, New York subway system, 
the seven trebles, the purple one, takes you out into Queens and Flushing Main Street and her parlour was literally a 30 second walk away from Flushing Main Street Station on Flushing Main Street. Uh, that stop is four stops away from where I was staying with Gem and Ian in Jackson Heights. I know it's like that's that's really not a problem, and that was the day I was going to be moving from Gemini's to uh, my other friends Billy and Nick's house on Manhattan. So I was going to be in transit anyway. So I thought, well, I'll leave their house. I'll have my suitcase. I'll go straight to Main Street, and then I can go back into Manhattan after it's done. It could not have worked out more perfectly. It was absolutely meant to be, and Miko was wonderful and did a great job. So before I do show the, the new tattoo, and I haven't shown this to anybody online yet, uh, I haven't Instagrammed it, I haven't, I deliberately wanted to save it for you guys. Now the people who I was teaching in Rhinebeck, of course they've all seen it. I'm hoping nobody has shared any photographs of it, I don't think so. Um, it's only a week old. Today is Wednesday the 25th of October, and this was done last Wednesday, which was the 18th, so it is, almost exactly a week old. In fact, it's now, uh, yeah, in one hour, she started work one week ago, if that makes sense. <clears throat> it's still looking a bit scabby. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, for anyone who doesn't have a tattoo, uh, the tattoo process is the, the work gets done. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm really struggling today. I like Theresa May at the Conservative Party conference, if anybody remembers that debacle. <laughs> Um, proving it can happen to anybody. Uh, I, yeah, the, the tattoo process is the needle goes into the skin and it abrades the skin quite a lot. Uh, and often the, 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 the wound will, will bleed a bit or uh, will react in different ways. And over the, the first 24 hours, the body secretes lymph fluid, which comes through the, through the the damage in the skin that's been done by the needle putting the ink underneath the skin and that can form scabs over the top but it also leaches out um, excess ink so more ink goes in during the tattooing process than will actually stay there for the rest of your life and that can mix with the blood and it can mix with uh, the lymph fluid and it can cause these sort of big old scabs the idea is you don't really want your tattoo to scab overly. Um, big scabs can cause damage to the ink underneath. I've got a couple of scabs which are looking a little bit like I didn't want them to. Um, this, is, this sounds like it's gonna be horrendous, it's not. I'm just thinking about the healing of the tattoo. So I've been using coconut oil to allow the tattoo to heal and uh, I like coconut oil. I'm not sure I would use it again. I think I want something, I wanted something greasier that would stay there. The coconut oil gets absorbed into the skin quite quickly. So it's going to be great for my skin. Anyway, the moment has come. I apologise to anybody who thinks, oh, that's looking a bit mucky. Um, this is how things are. But are you ready? Are you absolutely ready? I don't know what the, the lighting's going to be like, this, this crazy sort of colour, but here it is. So, as you can see, as you can see, it's music. It's a piece of music set on a background of a watercolour splattered version of the Pride rainbow flag. I absolutely love it. So you can see there's some scabbing here and here. It's all a bit clunky there. And you can't really see the detail very much of that music, I guess. Um, you can much more so in life. So what I'm actually gonna do is I'm gonna edit in some photographs that I've taken of it when it was just done. So hopefully once it's healed properly, it'll start looking like that. I love it. That's, that's where it sits on my arm. So it goes almost up to the elbow ditch and almost down to my wrist. Now Miko didn't know this. I don't think this was uh, deliberate in any way, but if I take my watch off and show you my wrists, my Thunderbird Tracks tattoo and the treble clef of my new tattoo, are almost in exactly the same distance, they're almost exactly the same distance from the creases of my wrist. So I like the synchronicity of that, that's lovely. I really love it. I mean, she has done a fabulous job. If I come 
close to and try and get some decent light on it. There we go. There, can you see? Oh, it's not going to focus properly. The some of the detail that she's she's put in to uh, some of the aspects of the music. The little three above the triplets. There, it's not. It's not going to focus properly at all, is it? Um, it wants to focus on my mantelpiece for some reason. Anyway, she's done a she's done a really really lovely job. I couldn't be more thrilled with it. I love the the flash of colour. I love what it represents. And of course, the question you're all asking is, what is the music? For anybody who watched the last episode of this podcast, you know what the music is. Can you guess? It's the finale song to uh, Ben's and my wedding film, Our Gay Wedding the Musical. This This is a song we wrote together, although the melody for the chorus is a melody that I wrote, so I feel I have a particular... Uh, we, we sort of, we kind of forget who wrote what, but, I, but this is a particular melody that I know came from me. Ben wrote the verses for this when I wrote the chorus. Um, and the, the song is called Love Is Everyone, and I couldn't subscribe to that belief any more than, it, than I do already. It's not possible for me to, to believe that any more than I do. Um, so I'll come again you can see it goes like this it goes love is everyone under the sun love is everyone and that's the song that you heard last time I played the 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 song I played a clip from the song on last week's episode and that is why it's set on the background of the 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 pride rainbow flag for equality and inclusion Um, so it's a very special and very personal tattoo to me uh, as I believe tattoos should be to to the tattooey the tattoo tattooed person Um, in this case there's a lot of stuff in here, a lot of symbolism and references, which makes it so very, very unique to me. I wrote this piece of music. I believe in the message of these lyrics. I deliberately haven't put the lyrics on as well. So I am aware I'm going to spend the rest of my life answering the question, what's the tune? <laughs> Just like I was aware of one of these, people say, do they mean anything? What do they mean? What does that one mean? Where's that from? Um, But it's a great conversation starter and it's a tattoo I'm incredibly, incredibly proud of. When when the the, the scabs heal, you can see just quite how bright and vibrant those colours are going to be. I absolutely love it. Uh, The tattoo itself didn't take a huge amount of time. I was with her... (laughs) I was with... Miko from one o'clock in the afternoon up until about half past six in the evening. So I was with her for five and a half hours. The first hour was her still working on the artwork. Um, she had it all up on the screen. So I've got the, these, these photographs that I'll show you now kind of document the, the process. This is how it looked when I first walked in and she had already done this much work on the screen. And then she had to make the, she separated the elements of it so she could make a transfer of the, the music on its own. And oddly, it was the music that she tattooed first. And that, once that had been done, well, actually, I can show you some of the process. If you're squeamish, you don't need to worry about this. If you're hyper squeamish, you really probably don't want to watch this next little clip. Um, but there's no blood to be seen. Uh, you can't see a needle or anything like that. It looks like she's drawing on my skin. That's, that's all it looks like. Um, So here's a little clip of of Miko in action. too bad was it uh, and then once she finished the uh, the music my arm looked like this and then she started putting the uh, the transfer on for what would become the watercolor she wanted to get a general shape for that 
And then after that, she worked the, the ink with a different type of needle. Now that one was painful. The, the, the music needle is a single needle, it's very, very fine. And it, 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 was war, it feels hot and it feels it's quite sharp, but it, it didn't hurt. I was dealing with that absolutely fine. And then when she started doing the, uh, the watercolour stuff and the coloured bit in the background, it was like, oh, the needle she uses has like three prongs on it. So it's bouncing up and down into the skin like that, making three times as many pricks at the same time. Didn't like that so much. Um, but overall, I would have to say it's absolutely not my most painful tattoo. Uh, certainly the music part, I could, have, I could actually have gone to sleep through some of it, uh, which was weird. I've never felt that before. No, I don't think I've felt that before. Anyway, uh, so then this was, this was how she built it up and these were the different stages and uh, she had her mobile phone with her because she was looking at that for colour references. And oh, this, is, this is a picture of how many inks she used. So it really does look like it's the, the rainbow flag, which only has the six colours in it, the red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and purple. But actually that, this is how many inks she used to get the, the graduations between the colours. Um, she's done a great job of blending them all together. And finally, this is what the tattoo looked like when she'd finished. So I, do you know, I love it. I'm staring at it all the time. I'm rubbing the coconut oil in uh, quite regularly and, and making sure that I'm getting a little bit itchy for lots of reasons. The tattoo scabbing is, is an itchy process, but also she shaved my arm and the hairs are growing back and that's getting a little bit itchy. Uh, but overall, I love it. I really, really do. There we go. There's, a, there's another little glimpse of it for you. Let me get my head out of the way, can you see? There it is, that is my love is everyone pride tattoo. And of course, tattoos are very special to me. I got hundreds. <laughs> anyway, that was the process. So the, the needle time was only about four hours, about an hour and a half of the time I was with it was all to do with the transferring and the, and the process I've just described. So it was a four hour tattoo, not too bad. And I, th uh, I ended up paying $700, which I think is very, very good value. Her fine line work is great. Um, how I'm actually healing on that, I'm not entirely sure whether it's gonna show up quite as well as it did when she did it, but that's my skin's fault, not her work's fault. Anyway, enough about that. I then had the great good fortune to uh, meet up with my new friend, Sam. Sam, hi Sam. Uh, everyone will remember Sam from the Twisted Soul uh, mystery knit along competition that I ran back in June, I think it was, um, and Sam was one of the winners. Sam was, is a new knitter and had made the Twisted Soul socks as his very first pair of socks, and he won a prize. Well, we met up briefly when I was in New York in August. He came to see me at Nitty City, and it was lovely. We got on really well. So we arranged to meet up and, uh, and have coffee and cookies. We went to Schmackeries on 45th, is it? 45th and 9th, or 46th and 9th, somewhere around there. Um, uh, it's like we had hot chocolate and uh, and cookies. I had, what did I have? Pumpkin spice cookie and maple bacon cookie. Now to Americans that's normal, to English people that's kind of weird. I loved it, it was delicious. These salty caramelized bits of bacon mixed in with the, the maple syrup and the, the, the cookie, it was delicious. Anyway, Sam, Bless your heart, Sam, it was really kind, had bought me a little present. And the present was two very nice skeins of yarn, which I'm going to show later as part of the stash enhancement part of this podcast, because there's quite a bit. <laughs> I didn't think I was going to come home with that much. Um, and I, well, we'll talk about that in a minute. So Sam, we had a lovely time, we'd love to see you. And then I met up with, uh, immediately after that, I, this was the, Friday. So I was going to Rhinebeck the Friday evening, um, Rhinebeck area, and I went to stay with my good friend Todd. Now, Todd, you're probably watching this. I don't know if you watch it straight away, but um, Todd and I had never met in person before, but we had absolutely... It's getting dark outside. Didn't think that was going to happen. I need to crack on with this, so I've got some light. Um, 
We never met in person, but we have a shared history. We were both in the same production of the Rocky Horror Show, the, the European tour. Todd was in the original cast and I did the cast a couple of years later. So we, we never worked together, we never met each other, but we know all the same people, did all the same things and went to all the same places. So it's like we have had the same memories, but they're just not from the same period of time. Uh, and Todd, we knew we were going to meet up with each other anyway, but he would very kindly said he, I could stay on his, uh, his sofa because he has a one-bedroom flat, but he has a nice big comfy sofa. And it's not that far away, it's about half an hour's drive away from Rhinebeck, from the Duchess County Fairgrounds, which is where Rhinebeck takes place every year. So we met up at Grand Central Station and we got on the train and went back to his place. Uh, and... And his cat called Rocky so <laughs> from the Rocky Horror Show, of course. And then the next day we went to Rhinebeck. Oh, I didn't know what to expect. I I have a big love affair with the Edinburgh Yarn uh, Festival, Edinburgh Yarn Fest, and and I knew it was going to be hard to top that. Well, I. Whether it did or not, I'm not entirely sure. It's a very different experience. It's mostly outdoors. The, uh, with the, the, the sort of like this long tents and long huts, but it has a much more outdoor feel. It feels a bit more like Fiber East for anyone who's done Fiber East because there's a lot of livestock there. There's live auctions. There's this is really a livestock show as well as the knitting and all the yarn. And boy, there's loads of knitting and loads of yarn. And it's absolutely huge. Um, there's so much more than anything I've ever experienced at any of the UK yarn shows. But I think... I wasn't really prepared for the level of attention that I got, me as, as Nathan, the designer, the teacher, the podcaster. Um, it was all lovely, don't get me wrong. Um, at times it was a little bit overwhelming. I, I, I thought, I'm coming to a foreign country, foreign to me, and I knew that a lot of people who follow this podcast are in the US. Hello to each and every one of you. And I knew that this was my first chance to get a chance to meet. But I'm going to say all this in an interview that you're going to see in a minute anyway. But um, I didn't, I didn't realise. There, there were times when there were lots of people thronging around who wanted to say hello, wanted to take pictures and uh, wanted to say thank you for doing this podcast. It's only, I mean, it, is, it really is only me burbling away at my phone for an hour and a half every now and then. But... It, it, I, I know that it, it forges connections with people and people feel they have a connection with me. And, and genuinely, it's not one way. I, I love that. You all know this. I love the fact that this podcast engages me with people I wouldn't other meet, otherwise meet. And Rhinebeck was a chance to meet them. So I couldn't go very far without getting stopped. And that's part of the reason I was there, obviously. So I'm, I'm not complaining about that in any way, shape or form. Um, I, was, I was just a little unprepared for the level of it. So next year, because I'm going back next year, obviously, um, I'll be more prepared for it. That's, that's, that's all I want to say on that front. So we, uh, we got in, Todd and I went through the, the gates and we, we got a special parking spot because he was able to say, I have an instructor here, where do we go? And they said, oh, this, this, so we didn't have to park in the field miles away. We were able to park quite near where it was all happening, which was great. And even though we didn't have a, hadn't registered the car or anything, it was fine. Um, and as we were queuing to go in, who should we meet? Now, Todd knew him already, but I'd, we'd never met. But Lars, Lars Reigns, who is modern Lopi. So if anyone who uh, doesn't know who Lars is, I'm sure you know the name modern Lopi. Uh, he specialises in Icelandic yoked sweaters. Uh, he's written several books on the subject and he's now working on creating texture in the yolks in, in certain ways. I don't want to talk about it in case he hasn't released that information yet, but I'm sure he has because he was wearing the sweaters at Rhinebeck. Um, but we got chatting and he's a darling, darling man. So Lars, if you are watching, I don't know if you do watch this podcast. Uh, oh boy, I was so glad to meet you. It was really, really, really lovely. And uh, this is this little clip is from our first meeting.
This is Rhinebeck. This is one of the most exciting things. I've literally just got through the gate, which is over there. And behind me are the first of the, the I don't know what it is, tents, huts, everything's going on. This gentleman to my right is Todd Thomas. Hey, hey say hi, Todd. Hey. Todd very kindly let me uh, sleep on his couch last night. So I uh, am indebted to Todd. We have a shared history of Rocky Horror in the European tour. Oh, Rocky. Uh, Rocky, there we are. And this is my first experience of Rhinebeck. Look, everybody, the first person I see as I walk through, it's Lars! Hey, it's everybody. Modern Lopey. How exciting! I'm excited too. What I'm going to meet this man. What are you planning to do mostly while you're here? I am going first to buy a sweater's worth of quantity of the Brooklyn Tweed Quarry in the new Ooh, colors. Oh, nice. Lovely. Yeah, I love the colors. It really so feels to so good too. Yeah. So, Very nice. And, um, do you know which color you're going to go for? You oh yeah, they have three new colors. They have a light gray finally, yeah. a red, mm -hmm. and a medium blue. And are they all going into the same project? Yeah, color work. Ooh, very yeah. nice. Rather yeah. like what you're wearing today, like of course. And there it is looking absolutely gorgeous. At Brooklyn Tweed Arbor. It's the DK. It's you're lighter. just a walking advert for the man. I am. <laughs> he makes good yarn. What can he I say? He really does. Well, Lars, have a great day. Thank same you for talking to me. And then, uh, we, we ended up spending quite a lot of time with each other. We saw each other at several points throughout and he very, very kindly on the Saturday drove me back to Rhinecliffe Station as well because I didn't know how I was going to get there otherwise because there doesn't seem to be a way of calling a cab. Um, and as you've got a car, it was about three miles. It would have taken me hours to walk there with my, my trundling suitcase and rucksack full of knitted samples. <laughs> it would have been a disaster. But Lars, you absolutely came to my rescue and thank you very much. So that was marvellous. Uh, and then Todd and I, we hadn't been there for very long when we were just chatting and then I spotted a besunglass spectacled uh, gentleman walking past, down past the, the pan pipe players. <laughs> There's a reason why I mentioned that. And I said, I know that hair and I know that beard. It was Alistair Post Quinn himself. Most of you who watch this will know that I am a huge fan of Alistair's work. Alistair, like me, is a double knitter, uh, and Alistair is a massive innovator in the craft, and it's his book, Extreme Double Knitting, that I recommend as further reading to everybody that I ever take in my classes. I always say, you know, if you want to do more, go to this book. Uh, the title, Extreme Double Knitting, isn't, it's not about extreme double knitting. It takes you from beginner level up to a level where you can do some really extreme things, like three colours and two patterns at the same time. Amazing. And he's lovely. You know, Alistair and I have interacted before several times, and we, we both had patterns in the same edition of Vogue Knitting. So we're, we're very aware of each other. Um, but we'd never met. And it was, I just went up to him and I said, Alistair, it's Nathan Taylor. I said, oh, hello. And, and I did a little interview with him as well. And you can see this right here. Enjoy. Interesting to show other <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Hi. I'm here with Mr. Alistair Post Quinn, the man who genuinely wrote the book on double knitting. This two, is the book. Well, definitely, but <laughs> the, the book is okay. the one I'm talking about. All right. Extreme double knitting, if you haven't already seen it. I, everyone knows I talk about your book all the time. So uh, this is the man himself. And this pattern is called? Uh, this pattern is called Twice as Sexy. And because it is because twice as sexy. Well, it's actually, the yarn is actually made, <laughs> is, the yarn is actually called sexy. So, so using it's two by uh, Buffalo Wool Company. That's brilliant. And so since there are two of them, it's uh, twice as sexy. So. Now, yeah. Alistair is one of the, uh, the biggest inspirations in the world of double knitting. And of course, double knitting being my thing, this is the man that uh, really knows exactly what he's talking about. If anyone doesn't know what Alistair Post Quinn <laughs> does, please look up on his patterns on Ravelry. You will have your minds blown. What are your big plans today? Do you have anything that you want to achieve? Uh, today, I just really want to um, uh, get out into the, uh, the, the the fiber world here in, uh, here in well, it's not New England, but the Northeast. Is this and, your uh, first time at Rhinebeck? Oh, goodness, no. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's mine, you see, so I'm like a kid in a candy shop. Yeah, mine. yeah. But there's always something new to see, and you know, even stuff that you, you think you saw last year is still still seems fresh. Uh, somehow, and and I really kind of uh, um, I just like to make sure that I've seen everything, see what's out there, see what's new, maybe get a few, buy a few things. Yeah. I almost never buy yarn here, but 
Sometimes. Just that one Sometimes special Sometimes just thing. a little bit, maybe. All those two special colors that once Always two. Together. Always two or maybe yeah. three or four. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, um, but yeah, mostly I'm here because I've got my books, uh, my new book, yes. um, Double or Nothing, which uh, just came out. It came out in December of last year, which means this is its first Ryan book. Yes. Um, uh, and my, what people might not know about Alice's second book is one of the patterns in it, I named it Abasiscus, which is a beautiful, beautiful tessellating uh, rectangles. And Alistair started a competition of asking people to suggest <laughs> names, and he chose mine! Yeah, it was a really good name, and thank you very much for that. My pleasure. And uh, he got a mention in the book. Excellent. Um, and, uh, uh, and that pattern's actually here. It's with, the, it's with Dirty Water Dye Works. Um, who provided the yarn for it? Amazing. So, so you can check oh, out I will, the Oh, I will be going itself. to look at it. I will, I will edit a little <laughs> clip of that pattern right now as we're talking about it. Alistair, um, thank you so much. It's been yeah, a genuine sure. honor to meet you. Thank you so much for talking yeah. to me today. Charming. Charming, charming, charming. I Sorry about the panpipe noise, that's what I was talking about earlier. Uh, so I adored meeting Alice. So that was, for me, that was a real thrill. Genuinely a real thrill. Um, I'm a big fan of his work and he's a nice guy, so what's not to love? Then we, uh, I was meeting Christy Glass. Now Christy Glass, you may remember, interviewed me on her channel in March this year when she was doing Manch. Now Manch is Christy's initiative where she celebrates men, man, in the, in the fibre world. They'd be they dyers, designers, knitters, all sorts of people. Any, it's just just men and and I think it's brilliant for for not only people like me as a man to uh, try and get more men into knitting but also someone like Christy who is not a man and I think that's it's great so we've got both so we could like a two-pronged attack together we'll get every, every man in the world knitting it was marvelous interview with Christy coming right up. I should have put this in later and time ran away from me, so here it is. Hey. Ladies and gentlemen, look who this is. Christy Glass first interviewed me on her channel and now I'm going to say a few words to her. Christy. I just, wait, I just realized I was looking at that and oh, not no, that. Oh no, it's over there. Hi everyone. It's so been a long day. This is Christy's craft room yes. at her lovely home and this is, I believe, the weekend stash. Is this yes, the, this is yeah. my weekend only knitting. How exciting. And you have very colorway themes that you seem to I can tell you what it is do you so, want yes to I do yeah tell thanks me for all. asking there it is okay so this is like hand spun mm -hmm. like so what's going on that kind of like special like hand spun or this like, is my favorite isn't it, it beautiful? beautiful Sam Piper amazing gorgeous this is like skinny single indie dye cray cray mohair mm -hmm. and that's my favorite of that one so this is like the wild yarns you kind of pick whatever mm -hmm. these are sweaters that are meant to they're going to be sweaters someday <laughs> yeah. like these are all specific projects the potential sweaters potential yeah. i know what they're going to be that same with that yeah this is leftover from my Ninel Chick Swancho, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. I got some cones from like a designer friend of mine, so I'm not sure what is I'll that do. Actually, sequins on one yes, of those. Yes, in fact, some of that <laughs> oh, that's in outrageous. My, some of that's in my penguano. <gasps> I love this. This is the campus yarn I have ever seen. Look, look at that catching the light. Makes Beautiful. me so happy. And then, so this is like, these are like could be a shawl. Yeah. So it's like true weekend knitting, like. Let me just make a shawl right now. Mm -hmm. This is my next um, sweater for Jill, with Jill Draper yarn. Oh, nice. And this is like some primrose that's this also going to be a sweater. Stuff is gorgeous. It's so beautiful. Yeah. This is my Where's My Bike from Amsterdam. <laughs> Um, this I is, love these minis. Yeah, these are from Buffalo, uh, the Buffalo Wool Company, which oh, is like lovely. really cool. Oh, lovely. I have cool. some of that at home. Yeah. It's just gorgeous. Really cool. So yeah. I'm, I'm thinking these need to marry the wool ears. Mm -hmm. I think they're going to be a marriage. Sock yarn, stop. Why not? And some of that is very sparkly. So sparkly. And then this is some Cormo and Shetland from Wing and a Prayer Farm. Sweaters quantity. Always, both. always. And then these are just kind of like some misfits, but that I just love and... Don't know what I'm going to do yet. I love them. So, Chrissy, how many people do you think you've stopped and accosted about their Rhinebeck sweaters today? Because <gasps> we had some fun earlier on, and I Chrissy and I were grabbing it. a few people. Um, um, but you were doing it all day. I have no idea. Maybe a hundred. <gasps> Maybe less than a hundred. And do you think you'll be able to feature all of those I interviews? will. I won't cut anyone out. That's amazing. I have a lot of editing to do. I know. I know. I'm still trying to edit together my holiday video. Yes. Of, uh, it's still not going to happen anytime soon. Yeah. Because I don't yeah. have the time. But so please tell me, tell me what has been the absolute highlight of your Rhinebeck 2017 so oh far? Oh my gosh. 
You know, it was so different this year because of the community that's been built digitally mm-hmm. coming to life. Yeah. We have really bad lighting, but we're much better okay, looking yeah, in person. I, I am hideous right now, but I can live with that. Same. Um, but, you know, it just was, like, so rewarding mm-hmm. to, like, meet, like, you. Because, like, you know, we've we've only met a little bit. Yeah, and we've and only met through chatting on FaceTime yeah, and only once. And, and I think we had a fun time. Yeah, I loved and I felt it, like and, I knew you straight away. Yeah, and I'm trying to, like, think of a duet we could sing, but, you know. Suddenly Seymour. I don't know it well enough. Suddenly <laughs> I don't know. I don't know it that well. I only know that part. That's it. It'd be fine. But you know that'd be fun if mm-hmm. we could do that. But that's not about. That's anything. next year. Uh, next year. Maybe <laughs> year. I will be here next you year. Will? Yeah, yeah, I'm coming oh, good. next year. Anyway, but so it was just very rewarding to be to be face to face with people and be like, "You mean something to me," you know. And I'm like, "Well, you mean something to me Likewise. because we're par- we're building this together." So. And we also have the same shared history as well as our performance background. Oh, you and, and me, think, yeah. yeah mm-hmm. And I think that made us uh, very. To find each other very engaging straight away, mm-hmm. but I think I've discovered already. I've hardly looked at any yarn today. Same. I know I was teaching mm-hmm. for part of the day, but for me, I've discovered that the reason I go to yarn festivals is not for the yarn; it's for the people. Same. And it's it's making the connections with the people that I have engaged with online in real life for the first time. Mm-hmm. And I met, uh, you know, David from Dog Dare Podcast. Yes, I've met him once. Oh, he's the sweetest mm-hmm. man ever. Hi, David, you're going to be watching this. Hello. Um, and it was so wonderful to meet him in person. Yeah. And I got to meet Alistair Post Quinn, who is the guy who, who wrote the original books on double knitting, extreme mm-hmm. double knitting, who's an absolute guru of mine. And yeah. I think he's amazing. And we've interacted again online, yeah. but... This being my first time to come to a, a US Rhymeck, state. Yeah. Um, Rhymeck Virgin, no oh, longer. I know, I know exactly. No longer. It, I, I'm sort of gushing about this, but it genuinely gave me a chance to engage with people that I can't do back home. Mm-hmm. And I have seen so many people and loved all of it. I want more tomorrow. I, I know. I, I, I'm, the good. yarn is secondary I, and I the agree. sheep are nice, but. I didn't even see an animal today. Not one animal. <laughs> At the sheep and wool. We'll, Freaking festival. And have you bought any yarn yet? I did buy a little yarn. And what are you going to do tomorrow? What's the plan? Tomorrow I'm not going back. Oh, you're not? No. You're done. I just so do this Saturday always. Oh, yes. yeah. You live here and uh-huh. you are just like in dash uh-huh. out. Exactly. Good girl. But did you find, I mean, I should have asked you, I mean, you answered the question without me asking, but did you find also like that your reach was more than you thought or just about the same or oh, do you know that's been really interesting i didn't know what to expect Here, i'm gonna Thank give you, you a break have that. i didn't know what to expect um and at times it was quite overwhelming because i've, I've always been aware that the majority of people who watch this crazy thing when i burble at my phone are here in the u.s in the u.s and mm-hmm. i don't live here so mm-hmm. for me this is the first real chance to engage with the people mm-hmm. and and say hello to the people who are interested in the crazy burbling that i do yeah and I didn't know to what extent that would be the case. Mm-hmm. And I've had so many people who've been so lovely and come up to me and said so many amazing things mm-hmm. and, and just wanted to say hello or take a picture. Yeah, just and like want that what quick moment. Yeah, and, and everyone's been really respectful and really friendly and mm-hmm. people have come up and said, I don't mean to interrupt, I just want to say thank you, I really enjoy what you do. And then they go. And yeah. it's been really, really very, very special. Yeah. I had a lot of that today too, which was nice. Just like oh, a quick Oh, you were mobbed hello. at one point. You had, oh. there was a, I saw you had this like crowd of people around we you. We had fun. The thing is, if anybody who's watching this doesn't already know what Christy does, Christy has become the talk show host of The Missing <laughs> World. She is our Ellen. <laughs> <laughs> totally. She's got the short hair. Um, she's our Ellen. And what Christy does is she promotes other people. Yeah. She finds people who she likes and is interested mm-hmm. in. And in a very generous and giving way, she puts that out on her channel, which is growing and growing and growing yeah. because now people know that she's the one-stop shop to go for, for those kind of interviews. Good. So if you don't know Christy Glass, get over to Christy Glass. Yeah, with a K and a Y, just like Kentucky. Exactly. And the jelly. Are you from Kentucky? No. No, I ridiculous. Just not, I just know how to spell it. Christy, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. So she does a thing where she stops people and interviews them about their Rhinebeck sweater. So if you've never been to Rhinebeck and don't know this, there's a big tradition of knitting a sweater that you can wear at Rhinebeck, specifically for Rhinebeck. And many people... The problem was, it was really hot. You've already seen in those video clips that the... uh, (laughs) It was really, really warm and really, really bright. So a lot of people were not wearing their own knitwear, which was a bit of a shame. However... Christy did talk to a lot of people and, and she enlisted me to, to sort of help interview and to grab people and, and chat to them. So we had a lot of fun doing that. I was also aware at this point um, 
that there were lots of people who were sort of standing back and watching us and people were filming us doing our thing because it was the two of us together, both quite sort of recognisable faces. Christy has these wonderful cheekbones and it's, it's beautiful beyond all measure uh, and, and very sort of animated and personable. She's an actress too, you know, what are you going to do? Uh, and then there's me who's usually a head taller than most of the, most people in the knitting world and I, and I have a bearded face and an English accent which over there uh, makes me sets me apart so I think people were aware of who we were and people were sort of surreptitiously taking photos and I became aware of that um, it was just it was a bit odd uh, I, I don't mind it I really don't mind it at all so if you do see me out and about feel free to take pictures post them tag me and I'd love to see that you've uh, I, but mention mention me in it so I can get a chance to see it and say hello but more than that Despite everything I've just said about it being a bit weird and a bit overwhelming, please come up and say hello. I, I had so many wonderful interactions with people who just wanted to come and say hi. Introduce yourself, tell me your name. Um, don't feel shy, don't sit there going because that's kind of awkward for both of us. Just come up and say, hello, I'm so-and-so and I watch your podcast or we've chatted on Instagram about such and such. Give me some kind of context. And even if we don't have a shared context, just say, hello, I'm so-and-so and I just want to say hi. And I will be delighted to, to share a hello with you and, and chat as much as I possibly can. Then there was the Ravelry meetup on The Hill, which is an area of the, the grounds which is set aside for this kind of thing. And there were hundreds of people, it was thronging, and that's where the majority of the attention took place. Not only that, but there was also the men's knitting retreat meetup. Now, this is a thing that happens at various points of the year in America. It's something I would de dearly love to be part of. A whole group of fabulous men knitters. Oh, I loved it. Todd took this brilliant picture uh, right here. There it is. And it's just fabulous. Uh, you've got on this side, here's Lars. And on so this side here, you've got Lars, and then I'm in the middle there, and there's Alistair. Um, and oh, at the back here, there's Rob Strauss, who is a brilliant weaver, and I've talked about his scarves on the podcast before. Uh, and so many people. It was just lovely to be in, in that much company of male knitters. You all know, my, I love my ladies. You know that, so don't feel left out. But it... it it's really special to be around, because it's unusual, that's why. It's, it's unusual to be around that many male knitters, and I loved it, I really did. At that same point, who should I bump into but the person I was most hoping to meet there, knowing he was going to be there as well, and that's David from Dog Dare Podcast. Now, I've talked about this a, long, a lot, and I watch David's episodes whenever he podcasts, and we've interacted quite a lot on email and on Instagram, and I've always adored him. You. You, I'm talking to you, David. I've always adored you. Uh, and I was really hoping we'd bump into each other. We'd message and said, I'm, I'm going to be on the hill. Are you going to be there at the meetup? And we found each other. And it was just brilliant. It was absolutely lovely. We had a little chat. And that is coming here. You are never going to believe it. Look who's here. It's David, Hello, everybody. everybody. <laughs> Look, this is amazing. <laughs> um, we literally just ran into each other because we're on the hill where everyone's doing meetups. I don't yes. even know what this is, but it's happening. It's amazing. And it's, it's not the best view of Rhinebeck behind me, but no. have you been seeing the sheep yet? I've seen the sheep and there's a pig over <laughs> here that I'm obsessed with. So Do I'm going like to break pig? it out. I Are you going to try and shear the pig and spin the pig? I'm just going to break it out of here and take it home. Weave with That's the pig. The I could weave, yeah. Put them on your say Yeah. Yeah, that would work. Do one of your art things. I'll give it a try. Now, for any, this is David from David from Dog Dare Podcast, who's David Dog Dare on Instagram and Dog Dare on Ravelry. Yep, Dog and Ravelry. Got it, yep. good. Uh, yep. So if you don't already follow this gentleman, he burbles away like I burble away. And if you like a burbler, this is your man. <laughs> We're a match. <laughs> He's delightful. David, I, oh, I just loved meeting you and I can't wait to see you again and hopefully spend some more time and actually just maybe not in that whole sort of bustle and madness, but to sort of sit down and go for a, a meal and something like that. And we'll just have a lovely time because love ya. So then I had to shoot off because I had my first class to teach. And I hadn't even seen any yarn. I, I literally, Todd and I hadn't done very much. We'd wandered around with Christy, then we went to the meetup. And, and it was just, I was loving every second of it. It was brilliant. 
And then I had to go teach. So I went to meet Karen Santucci, who is the festival workshop organiser. Now, she and I have had quite a lot of emails over the last six months or so trying to sort all this out. Uh, because, of course, remember that I, I was only there as a sort of guest volunteer basis. I don't have a work permit. I can't work in the States. So I wasn't getting paid for being there. It was just on my own dollar. And I didn't mind that at all. I genuinely didn't mind that at all. But so she and I had been trying to find ways of seeing if we could make something work and it, and with work permits and stuff. And it wasn't going to happen. So I was there as a guest volunteer speaker. Um, but I wanted to meet her in person because she's been brilliant. Now, Karen has this very direct, blunt sense of humour. She's absolutely hysterical and in the flesh one of the nicest women but don't mess with her i can see there's there's a there's a sort of rod of steel at that woman's backbone and she's not going to brook any fuss from anybody but i adored her and she put me in this this place so a lot of the classes are intense i mean my class is quite intense as well but <laughs> stupid boy that's not what i meant um they're in buildings that are made of canopies and cloth of tents little gazebos um and i knew that in that kind of heat because it was really warm and really really warm um that wouldn't be great for me so i was actually put in a building which was its own like a little self-contained restaurant type bar it looked like a little miniature bar it had a bar area in it we had our own bathroom facilities which was great um and then my people arrived and 12 lovely ladies, should have been 14, about which more in a moment, 12 lovely ladies uh, arrived and we had an amazing fun time learning to double knit together. I, I, I can't tell you how much it meant to me that they'd all done their homework brilliantly, they all knew the cast on that we were going to be doing, didn't have to waste any time catching people up on that, it was amazing. And then... Uh, and then it was time to go. So Todd came and met me there and uh, he drove me back to my digs, which were, which were fine and dandy, um, which were in Rhinebeck. And I took a little bit of footage that, that night. It looks like this. So it's quite late on Saturday night here in Rhinebeck. I've just come home to my little apartment here. This is the kitchen um, where, I, where I'm staying this evening. The organisers have kindly put me up. Uh, here in in Rhinebeck itself, but it's a little little way out from the fairground. Just come back from the fabulous uh, party at Christy Glass's house, which was just so lovely and so lovely to spend time with her. Let me show you around. It's kind of dark, and I can't find many light switches. <laughs> but I've got uh, my own little bathroom, which you don't need to know about because we all know what happens in there. And then this lovely bedroom, uh, which is all wood panel ceilings and wood panel floors and. Uh, this is a lovely bed with loads of things on it, and, and that's the door that is outside. I'm a lucky man. I'm here enjoying the fruits of what Rhinebeck has to offer. Um, I've had a genuinely overwhelming day. Um, and I'll talk more about this later, but so many people have uh, come to say hello. It became quite, quite overwhelming at, at one point. Um, I wasn't quite sure where it was going to end and there were people who were waiting to talk to me while someone else was saying hello and it, but, it, but overall everyone was just so friendly and so respectful and and a real lovely bewilderingly uh diverse range of people that were coming up to me men women girls boys um all wanting to say hello which was was really thrilling and and the class went exceptionally well uh, I didn't look at any yarn. <laughs> I've hardly looked at any yarn at all. Um, so tomorrow I have another class from 10 until 1. And I will be teaching my second class then. And once that's done, I can... See, I'm very tired. I can't put coherent sentences together. But when that's done, I can just sit back and enjoy. From some one till five, I've got four hours to just enjoy the festival and see some more fabulous sights and maybe do a little bit of yarn buying. Uh, unless there's something really fantastically special. I don't know. But I know there's lots more people that I'm going to be meeting tomorrow and I cannot wait, so bring it on. And... Then it was the next morning and I had a morning class, not an afternoon class, so I went back in. And joy of joys, oh, I was wandering down the street on the way to get there because I was about, 
about a mile away from the ground. It took about half an hour to walk there. Uh, and Rhinebeck, oh my goodness. Rhinebeck itself, the town, is so pretty. The, uh, the colours, as they call them, weren't really putting on their show fully at the moment. It's been so mild that um, the October they're having hasn't been the full riot of, of tree colours that they normally have. But even what I saw was beautiful and impressive and far brighter than the things we normally see here in the UK. But it was just wonderful walking up and down the street. Well, I didn't walk up and down, I walked down the streets to get to the, the fairground. And I shot this bit of footage there. I'm currently making my way from where I stayed last night at my digs to, look I have my, my suitcase here, um, to my second class at Rhinebeck today and it's, I just had to stop and show you how pretty the town of Rhinebeck is. It's so leafy and residential and beautiful and the, it's just, <laughs> the colours are going on the leaves, on the trees which is amazing. It's a little bit later this year than apparently than normal because it's been so mild and it's beautifully warm. It's fresh and crisp and cold today, but it's gonna warm up beautifully because that sun is already glorious. But I'm just enjoying the surroundings so much. This, this trip keeps on giving and I cannot wait to see what the rest of today has in store for me. And then I got there. And I've arrived. It's a beautiful sunny morning, as you can tell. I'm just, that noise you can probably hear is my trundling suitcase. It's just after nine o'clock. I'm one of the first people to arrive today, but I say that, it's already kind of busy. There's lots of people ahead. Look at the colors on those trees, just outrageous. Uh, I'm now gonna just go and check in, get ready to start my class, and then we start the day. And then I had my class, and joy of joys, 16 rather than 12. Terry and Lana, you know I'm talking to you. <laughs> Hello. Now Terry and Lana were supposed to have been at my class the next, the day before. I don't know what happened. I don't know why they didn't make it. They got the days muddled up or something went wrong, but we managed to squish them in on the, on the second class as well. So all was not lost and everybody got taught. Uh, but joy of joys, I had a boy in my class. Henry. I'm talking to you. Uh, it was so delightful, so delightful. To, he's, he's, Henry is the third male knitter I've had in my classes ever. That's not very many. I want more, please. Um, I taught Dan Jones, hello Dan. Hi Kay as well, but I'm talking about you, Dan. Taught Dan to knit, but that wasn't an official class. That was just the two of us over FaceTime, so that's very different. But it was really, really nice uh, to, to be able to pass on my love and the way my brain works and, and get inside another male brain as well. I, I loved it, I really did. And I know, because he's, uh, he's Instagrammed his, fi his finished object that he's... He and I also know, Henry, that you're gonna be working on Peano number one next, so good luck with that. Boy, oh boy, and then, uh, then I was done. Um, I didn't have anyone else that I needed to be, I wasn't spending time with anyone particularly, I could just go off and enjoy the rest of the festival. So there were lots of people coming up to me and saying hi and thanking me for my tutorials and saying how helpful that's been, which is really gratifying to me because I've always wanted the tutorials to be out there as a way of sort of giving back a bit to the knitting community and I don't monetize my tutorials, I, I, I keep those free. I mean, they're free anyway, you just watch an advert, but um, I don't do that with the tutorials because I don't want that to be seen as, as money grabbing. Um, whereas this podcast, money grabbing. This is my career now, I have to, I have to earn a living. Um, but I had the good fortune to meet uh, Eric from Sticks Plus Twine, so hello Eric. I didn't get a chance to meet Sebastian. Oh, the day before as well, I was able to meet up with Tracy and Jody from the Grocery Girls. I felt a bit bad, actually. Girls, you are so damned popular. Um, they, where they were standing under this little tree, there was a massive queue of people literally waiting to say hello. The proper royal receiving line. It was hysterical. Um, and well deserved, you know, the girls are fantastic. Um, but I had to go off to my class and I saw them and I, was, and I knew there was a queue and I was like, I can't, that's I, and they'd spotted me and we were like, hello, so they came running over and, wanted, and we had this photograph taken, uh, which Todd took for us. And I was like, I'm sorry to everyone in the queue. I'm really not cutting in. I've just got to go to a class. And, and I think people were suddenly realising that 
who I was, and I was there with the grocery girls, and they were, it, it just became ridiculous. It was just like, oh, just this crazy podcast of madness going on. <sighs> Can you tell? I was getting really, really excited by the whole thing. And actually, jumping back to the day before, um, I met two very, very special young men. Uh, my eye was caught by the younger of the two brothers, but the older of the two brothers is also a very special young man. Now, the reason why Bailey, who is the younger lad, uh, caught my attention was because I was talking to somebody and he was standing back and he was clearly waiting to say hello. Now, Bailey, I don't know, if, I don't know how old you are. I think you might be about 10. Is that about right? I'm, I'm sorry if that's, that's the wrong number to, to give you, but, but Bailey was wearing head to toe knitted clothes. Not just knitted clothes, a hat, uh, a, a top, a cardigan, some trousers, socks, and some knitted slipper shoes. And he had a knitted stuffy toy, but also a knitted shawl. And it was all colour coordinating, yellow coordinating, yellow and blue. And he had knitted all of it himself, even this very complicated lacy pie shawl. Mm -hmm. He'd been knitting for about a year. And his dad was with us as well, so I, I should mention that. It, these were not unchaperoned children. Uh, and his brother, Jeremy, so it's Bailey and Jeremy, um, they live in America, but they're from Australia. And uh, Jeremy is also a very, very good knitter. And he had in his bag, uh, not on display, um, I think of the two, Bailey, I think you're the extrovert. Jeremy, you like to, to keep it more private, don't you? Um, but he had this wonderful jumper. He'd chosen some beautiful autumnal colours and he was knitting himself a jumper. And Jeremy, are you maybe 12? Have I got that right? I, I'm really bad at guessing ages, but to, to give everyone a, a bit of a context, the two brothers, uh, they're with their dad uh, and then they own a sheep farm, the parents. And uh, dad, I didn't get your name, I'm so sorry. And their mum is a, a shearer and a spinner. Uh, and he's no he's the shearer she's the spinner and so they, they work on the sheep farm so there's there's fiber craft in these boys blood most definitely and it was just so so lovely to see two young men entering the world of fiber craft and really really going for it going it big time and I adore both of these young chaps they're they're polite they're friendly they're charming so well mannered clever just wonderful, wonderful young men and, and two new boy knitters in the world, which makes me so happy. They're going to grow up and do big things, I think, in the knitting world. Um, watch this space. So, oh, and Bailey said that his next task is double knitting, so I'm hoping that uh, if I go back to teach at Rhinebeck next year, that maybe uh, Bailey and or Jeremy will, will be wanting to take one of the classes with me. That would be amazing. <clears throat> get the boys in, get the boys in, that's what I say. So then uh, I taught my second class uh, and I was wandering around and I saw Eric uh, from Six Plus Twine and, uh, and then I spent more time with Lars but mostly I was wandering around on my own, just this was my yarny time. And I did buy some yarn. And I was given a couple of skeins of yarn on the first day as well. So I think it might be time to jump into the stash enhancement, don't you think? I'm just gonna go and get it. I've realized it's not down here, bear with. So there's lots of things in this stash enhancement, not just stash. Look at this wonderful bag. Look at this absolutely gorgeous Mo bag. That's not Mo as in homo, although it might as well be. That's Mo as in moustache. Or moustache, whichever people want to say. I was uh, dictating a message recently and I had a little conversation with someone and I had to go and I was, uh, di excuse me, dictating it to Siri and I said, anyway, moustache, and it spelt moustache. <laughs> so now I'm going to be signing off all my text conversations with anyway moustache <laughs> this was a gift from lovely Cindy who uh, took my first class on the Saturday and it was very very kind of her I'm going to take some stuff out of it because I was filling it up with, with things that other people gave me um, 
Oh, and some Tic Tacs for no reason. Uh, and it's got this fabulous, she said almost rainbow inside, and she's right, and, and I'll, I'll definitely go with that. But it's a really nice little sock-sized project bag, uh, and it zips up towards the handle, which is great. It's got a wrist strap. It's a lovely, lovely size, comfortable strap for putting on my wrist while I'm knitting, and then the yarn come out the top. That, for me, perfect sock project bag. In fact, the bag that I've got a sock project in at the moment. Oh, actually, I've, I've got the wrong bag here. Anyway, I've got a sock project bag, which I think wants to come in here rather than the bag that it's living in, because I really like this. Marvellous. So, Cindy, thank you so much for that. Uh, I was also given, oh, bits of chocolate. Loads of people, loads of people gave me chocolate. Um, Dina, who gave me some chocolate in Nitty City when I saw her in August, also had, some, she was in my class and had some fabulous chocolate for me as well. She gets the best chocolate I'm not going to show it to you, as I can't. <laughs> Didn't last very long. Dina, thank you so much. Uh, and then I met uh, the wonderful, is it Suzanne? Yeah, Suzanne uh, from Groovy Hughes Fibre. Groovy Hughes Fibre, she, uh, obviously, look, the rainbows. Fabulous, what's not to love? Oh, there is some chocolate here. Oh no, this this is this is the one. This is the one I didn't eat. This is from uh, this is maple and nibs. Uh, this is from Dina. This is fun. Uh, everything else I've eaten has been got. Oh, it's vegan and gluten free. I did not know that. Ah, wherever wherever Dina goes to get her chocolate, she finds the best stuff. She really does. And a few people gave me some stitch markers. This is from uh, this is from Susan Mindel who is uh, She Knits One on Ravelry. And she says, Nathan, thank you for your podcast. I feel like we're knitting friends. And she's given me this nice, very nice little uh, stitch marker there, which is on um, like wire rather than cable. So it's not gonna distort any stitches at all. So if I'm doing anything, anything with like a close gauge, that's gonna be perfect. So thank you to you. Um, oh, I've got given a little stitch marker by the Miss Babs team only because I made a purchase, which I'll show you in a sec. But I've also got something in here, which is also a nice little gift. Now this, this is very special, but I need to do some research into it. One of the people in my class had taken a class with the lady who made this. I've never met this lady. The lady is called Leslie Wind, and she makes clasps and closures and and shawl pins and all sorts of things here. And she says, "This is a please accept this cable needle as a gift." Yours sincerely, Leslie. And she'd asked, she knowing that uh, the lady who took my class was going to be taking my class, she gave this to her to pass on to me. And it's it's beautiful. Oh, I've just dropped it. It's beautiful. She's made it herself. I don't really know how to, to use it. I know it's a cable needle and I can use it for that, that's no problem, but I, all, I also believe it's a shawl clasp as well. And look, isn't it unusual? It's these two curved bars separated by a chain. So obviously if you're hooking things, making you know, cable needles, you can knit it on there, you can slide them across and knit them off the other side. That's not a problem, that's really nice and easy. I guess. I guess maybe you just sort of hook it on like that and then let it dangle at the back while you're doing the cable and then take it off the other side. That's all fine. But I believe it's also, I mean, it's just this cable needle. So maybe I've been misled. Leslie, I'm going to contact you. I don't know if you, you I'm sure you watch this podcast because otherwise you wouldn't know who I am. Um, I'm going to contact you because I want to know if this is a shawl pin, if there's a way of using it to, to, to clip a shawl in place, then that's going to be lovely because it's, it's beautiful material. I don't know what the material is. It's got something stamped into it here, but in this light, I can't see what it says. No, it's tiny. I'll have to look at that another time. Um, but it's, it's very gorgeous. It's heavier than you might think. And it's clearly hand beaten into, into shape. I love the, the, the sort of the, the slight handmade texture of it. It's very, very lovely, and I'm delighted to own it. So, <laughs> Leslie of Leslie Wind is lesliewind.com. Um, and 
And if you're interested in the kind of things that she makes, clasps and closures like that, then head over. Look at my eyebrows. Uh, very nice. Thank you so much. So anyway, the other non non yarn related thing is still all wrapped up. And there's a very good reason for this. I wanted to keep this and share this with you. This you can't really see here is a book. It is a children's book and it is uh, illustrated by, it's written by Sheila S. Cunningham and it's illustrated by Kathy Kelleher. It is called Willow's Walkabout, A Children's Guide to Boston. It's all wrapped up lovely here. I'm gonna rip it open now. I'm so excited, this is lovely to see it. Now, the reason I was given this, not because I'm a child, is because Kathy Kelleher, the illustrator, was in my class. Not only was she in my class on Sunday, look at those beautiful illustrations. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have a look in this in a second. It's my first, I'm so excited. Uh, not only was I, she in my class, but before I knew she was going to be in my class, uh, on the, I was just going towards the registration place where I could get the keys to open up the building. And I saw in the distance, somebody wearing one of my patterns. <laughs> it was the All Hallows hat, which is the pumpkin madness, which is very, very appropriate for this time of year. And I went running over to this lady and I said, excuse me, uh, and I wanted to, I was gonna say, I designed that pattern. I was really excited to see one of my patterns out in the wild. Uh, and as I turned around, as she turned around, she said, oh, oh, she said, I'm gonna be in your class in a minute. I was like, oh, brilliant. That's why she was wearing the hat. But she gave me this. It's so beautiful, oh, she's, she's very good. These illustrations are gorgeous. Oh, it's, oh, it's personalized. <gasps> this is even better. Oh. Bless you. To Nathan, you are my knitting guru. Thanks for the joy. Love, Kathy. P.S. Here's a guide to Boston, should you ever visit. Well, I'd love to. I'd absolutely love to. So let's find some, look at, oh, these, this is beautiful. This is some of Kathy's illustrations. Clearly, one very, very talented lady. I'm not going to go through this whole book now, but there's, it's beautifully done. Mmm, yes. Yes, she's marvellous. I'm going to savour this. I'm not going to go through looking at all the pages now, but thank you so much. So if anybody is looking for gifts for their children, look out the work of Kathy Kelleher because uh, she's very good. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's very, very much appreciated. I shall say for that. So, prior to Rhinebeck and prior to seeing Sam, we're now in Stash Enhancement. It's getting darker and darker, isn't it? Hang on. Has that helped us? Well, yes, I think it has. So prior to Rhinebeck and prior to being in, do you know what? I'm gonna move it. What's that like? That's not too bad, actually. That's that's pretty good. So it's getting a bit darker here, but I've got the light on me now. You can see it in the in, see the, the yarn. So prior to being in Rhinebeck and prior to even meeting Sam, I went down into Soho and I went to Pearl Soho. I've not been before. I've been to Nitty City twice, but I've never made it down to Pearl Soho. It was lovely. I had a really, really nice time in there. Um, and what I liked about Pearl Soho is their exclusive yarns, which are just for them. They've got some beautiful fibres there, some beautiful blends, um, and some really, really nicely milled stuff. And it's on their own label, the Pearl Soho label. And I couldn't leave without taking some with me. Uh, and I found this, this is their worsted twist, and it's called salt and pepper. It's like a, it's their helix style of twist. I love it, like barber pole. You don't often get this in commercial yarns. Isn't that gorgeous? Mm hmm It's gray and cream, natural. And it is uh, 164 yards, 100 grams. It's kind of like a DK weight, really. Um, maybe a bit thicker, maybe. Oh, well, a worsted twist, it's sort of a worsted weight. And it's 100% merino wool on the Pearl Soho label. It is so smooth and soft. It feels like there's much more in that than just merino. It feels like it must have something more luxurious with it. It's. It's gonna be like butter to knit with. It's, uh, even Ben doesn't feel that this is a major issue. That's how soft it is. It's, it's bouncy and squishy beyond all imagining. 
and I, th I don't know what I'll do with it. I suspect it will be a hat because I, I don't have much of a um, issue with wool itch, but I, I sometimes do get a little bit itchy on my forehead and that ain't never going to happen with this. I'm amusing myself now, just looking at myself with the camera. It's gorgeous, it's absolutely gorgeous. I really, it's not about anything. Um, it's beautiful. I could, I could sit here and this is one of those ones you can squish for ages and ages and ages. Absolutely lovely. And then, as I said, I met up with Sam, who is Sam I Am NYC on Ravelry. I met up with him in Schmackeries. And the naughty man presented me with two skeins of very, very lovely yarn, 801010 MCN. One of my favourite sock blends. <laughs> did you see that? Did you? Did you? <laughs> Here it comes again. <laughs> They're gorgeous, aren't they? It's called, it is a yarn carnival, hand dyed yarns made in Texas. Uh, this is the goat roper base. It's 100 grams, 400 yards, fairly standard stuff. This is called indigo fern. It's really, it's, it's a bit, yeah, that's probably, mm, that looks a bit bluer on screen. It's much more of a purple than that. I'm not going to get the right colours in the light. So um, it's very, it's got a depth to it. It's heathered, as you can see, different tones in there. And then there's this, which is magenta 1859. I... I love this colour. Individually, this is beautiful. Individually, this would be my favourite of the two. But together, I think they're stunning. And this being um, uh, with a little bit of cashmere, it's got that lovely squish to it. I don't think I'm going to make socks with this. I think because there's two of them, I think this would be a really, really lovely just a little brioche wrap. Something like that. Something to wear to wear these two colours together. I think that's going to be very, very, very special. I might um, I'll just play with some directions and things and maybe just, I don't know, just knit some brioche. Why not? Beautiful. Thank you so much, Sam. I really, really appreciate that. That's gorgeous. And then there were a couple of gifts which happened while I was at Rhinebeck. They both happened within about half an hour of each other. And uh, they both consist of yarn. Where's the other one? And this was the first one. Now, a lady called Gabby came up to me. And Gabby is from Once Upon a Time Corgi Handmade. Sorry, Once Upon a Corgi Handmade. Uh, there's her card. Once Upon a Corgi Handmade. And uh, this is her card. And I don't know, she's got her name on it. Um, but that's Gabby. And she presented me with this very, very lovely skein of yarn that she dyed herself. The colours are called No Sleep Till Rhinebeck, which I really, really like. That's lots of fun indeed. And she, this is 100% Superwash Polworth, which is very interesting. I don't, I'm not familiar with Polworth. Uh, it's the fingering weight, 437 yards. That's going to be 400 metres, isn't it? Um, hand dyed yarn for best care, hand wash and warm water, all the usual stuff. And it's this. It's really, really lovely. So it's greys and browns and yellows and peachy orange, like a coral colour. And there's, a, there's some sort of speckling going on, but it's not really a speckled yarn, but it kind of is. Um, it's, it's not all speckled, but there's some definite tones in some of these greys. It reminds me of something I can't quite place my, put my hand on. Is it, it's a type of duck. Isn't there a type of like mandarin duck or something like that that's that got these colours in it? I forget. But it's really, really lovely. Um, and I, I can't thank you enough. Very nice. So this is onceuponacorgi.com is their website. I'm assuming she likes corgis. Now, knock me down with a feather when the second person presented me with a, a gift of a skein of yarn. And I say knock me down with a feather because the colours of the two skeins of yarn were ridiculously similar. Now, I don't 
mean that ridiculous as in for that. But it's just a real coincidence, a real, real coincidence that this happened. This is from Lambstrings Yarns. And it's a lambstrings yarn, sorry, not yarns, lambstringsyarn.com in the colorway Monarch. And again, this is hand dyed on this, the Tralala sock base, which is 100%, uh, sorry, not at all, it's 75 25 merino nylon. And this is a 50 gram sample skein that she, that she had a few to, to give away, and she gave me one, which is absolutely beautiful, and the colorway is called Monarch. Now look at that. It's beautiful. It's really, really beautiful. And look at that. They're so similar in terms of the palette. This one looks a bit more browny on the screen, but actually there's quite a lot of the gray in there. And then you, it, it's, it's as if, if someone had given me two blue skeins of yarn, I wouldn't have found that unusual at all. But these people did, weren't together. They're very, very similar in terms of tone. Anyway, back to this one. It's softer than the Polworth. I think the Polworth is not, it's not scratchy at all. It's a um, firmer yarn. Whereas this one is very, very soft. Um, it feels more like an MCN base actually than a, than a 75-25. So it's, it's really, really nice. Um, and the colors are beautiful. There's less speckling in this one. These, these are flatter colors, but there's definitely sort of a, a little variegation in the tone here. And it's seen, it goes a little bit more into sort of purples and browns I guess, rather than the gray, although there's definitely gray in it. I mean, <laughs> but they're both very, very beautiful and I'm delighted to own them. I'd be interesting, you know, I could put these in, a, in the same project and you probably wouldn't really see where the join is. I, 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 don't, I don't know how that happened. I don't know, perhaps I'm being stupid. Perhaps there was an official set of Rhinebeck colors that people do. I don't know, maybe, because that, that one's called one, um, no sleeps till Rhinebeck. This one's called Monarch, so I guess that's after the butterfly, maybe, I don't know. But beautiful, and thank you to both ladies for your very kind gifts. I very much appreciate it, and I thoroughly look forward to knitting with those. Then on to my Rhinebeck pur purchases. It looks like I'm not really watching you all. Yeah, if I watch, look there, which is where I normally look, it looks like I'm looking off camera. That's you, isn't it? So I've got to be more careful with this phone. It's a learning process. So then I was wandering around and I bought, yeah, I bought five skeins of yarn of my own. I don't think that's a massive amount. Um, I did quite well. Um, I didn't worry about the cost. There was one, there was some wonderful things there that I really wanted to take home, but some of them were expensive. There was one, it was mohair locks yarn. So it was like locks of mohair spun together and it, it looked like it was, came straight off the mohair animal. The, is it a goat? <laughs> I can't remember. <coughs> I think my hair's a goat. Um, but it looked like fleecy spun. And it was lovely, it was gorgeous colours, but it was like, it was $54 or something like that. And I thought, no, I, I don't know what I would do with it. If I had a perfect project in mind, I might splash out, because it was rather special. But um, the first thing I bought was this. Now this is from, this is alpaca tweed from A Touch of Twist in New York State. A touch of a touch of twist dot net. Now this is very nice. Actually, I did buy another skein of yarn, but it was a gift for Todd. For uh, I, I got that from I forget. I uh, bought him a nice, beautiful this brown because he likes his earthy colours. Now this is alpaca tweed. It's three hundred yards of three ply yarn. And it's this black and brown twist. That's looking very accurate on screen. That's probably more accurate now. It's changed like that. Uh, beautiful, beautiful. It's so gloriously, deliciously soft. The skin's about to fall apart. Hang on, let's put that through there. It's so lovely. I mean, you know me and alpaca. It's, oh, it just... Everything about this yarn delights me. I have no idea what I want it to be, and I'm on a real bright colour kick at the moment. Um, so it's outside my usual sphere of what I'm buying right now, but I needed it. I touched it on the skein and I needed it. It was hanging in a hank. It wasn't all skeined up like this, but oh, it's beautiful. So that is from A Touch of Twist. And they're in Pattersonville, NY. A Touch of Twist dot net is their website. Stunning, stunning, stunning. It, this, is, this is not about the colour, this is about the feel. There were, there were other colours as well, but I like, I like 
I like natural colours when it comes to alpaca because alpacas come in a variety of shades. Gorgeous. Just gorgeous. Then, then I, do you know, I don't know what made me buy this, except it was the colour. It's 100% Superwash Merino, so it's not a particularly special base or anything like that. Um, and this is from um, Persimmon Tree Farm. And uh, this is four ounces, so it's approximately 560 yards. That's quite a lot. Uh, four ounces, I thought that was about 100 grams, but this feels like a fingering weight. I don't, I, I don't know. I, I... Anyway, it's this. <laughs> it's greens and oranges and yellows, all different types of green. We've got this sort of limey green, we've got this dark, deep green dark, deep green, and the yellows go run from one to the other. I don't know how many dyes that is, but there's loads of different colours and shades of that in there. Um, it looks like... looks like that. Oh, isn't that nice? That's going to be something rather lovely. Again, it, I'm not going to make socks out of this. I think there's, there's more to it than that. Um, it's... Uh, there's so much of it, I think this should be something to wear around the neck because it's such bright colours as well. It's really, it's really, really nice to wear that kind of thing. Let's just roll that out a bit more. And then tuck the end back through where it came from. And we've got our skein again, but that is just really, really nice. It's a sort of, feels very 70s to me, this, this kind of orange and the, these colours. I, it's completely dark outside now. What's going on there? It was afternoon when I started this podcast, only an hour and 20 minutes ago. <laughs> so I really love that. So that is uh, what's their website? What did you say? Uh, anyway, but they're Persimmon Tree Farm. This is the Piggy Toes Superwash. Uh, uh, does it have a Piggy Toes 740? PT 740 is the colorway name, but I really like it. It's very soft, as Superwash Merino tends to be. Very nice. Ooh. It smells hand washed. It smells like fabric softener. Nice. <laughs> that was an unexpected smell. I didn't expect that. That's what unexpected means, thank you. You're talking tautologically. As I often do. Too many words, you see. Uh, oh, in the light, maybe we can see some colours on my tattoo that you hadn't seen before. Oh well. There it is. That's what it's looking like. Gorge. And then. Um, then I saw this. Now this is again an unusual. I don't. I come afraid the tag doesn't say the no, the company name, so I can't advertise them. It's mohair, wool, and alpaca. Ben cannot touch this. He can't go anywhere near it. However, <clears throat> I can, um, and I love the colours and I love how it's plied. It's very unusual. This I like a lot. I have no idea what it's going to be. I wanted to own it. It's kind of a rainbow. And you know I love me rainbows. Hello. And uh, it's 180 yards, four ounces. It was fifteen dollars fifty, so it's a good price. And if you look individually at the strands, it's two colours loosely wrapped around each other. That's not going to focus. Is it? That's orange and green. And here we've got burgundy and blue plied around each other. Uh, in other places, there's. Yeah, there's blue and green, so I don't know if it's some kind of infinity ply or whatever, the um, fractal plying is. I don't know how those colours interact. We've got uh, the burgundy and the yellow. So we seem to have, there's the four colours, there's blue, green, burgundy and goldy orange. And they uh, obviously all feature with each other at all times at some point. Um, it's a bit scratchy, it's not, it's not scratchy. It's, it's got an edge, well, on the face, it's got a bit of an edge to it. Um, but I think it's, I think it's lovely colours. I really do. I like that a lot, and I think I think it'll, it'll work up very in a very marled way, um, and marling is obviously so. So modish right now that that I think is going to knit up into something very very nice indeed. Don't know what. It's not going to be a hat. No, even even for me, that's that's not going to work. Um, what else could it be? Suggestions, please, in the general chatter thread, not the podcast questions thread. You know that, don't you? You know that, right? Yeah, okay. So, uh, yeah, put your answers on a postcard and 
post them to Ravelry. <laughs> Don't put them on a postcard, put them on, post them on a thread. Uh, so that I think is beautiful. I love the colors. And now there's just two more, two more. Which one to say first? I'm gonna talk about the big one. This is again, four ounces, 590 yards. It's generous, generous yardage. And this is called Conitu. It is uh, from Rose Spring Farm in Jennersville. It's an Australian superwash merino. It's very unusual. Uh, I don't have any Australian yarn, I don't think. This one, I was sold on the colors. I could not leave this on the shelf. <laughs> it's the brightest skein of yarn you've ever, ever, ever seen. Um, it's beautiful. It, if you look closely, it's yellows, it's like acid lemon and lime, bright, vibrant lime green that sometimes tips over into sort of bluey green. It's just got, there's so much of it. It's bouncy, it's thick. Um, it looks like, to me, it looks like a, a quite a high twist um, uh, fingering weight, but it's very, really bouncy. There's so much to it. There's a lot of it. I mean, there's enormous amounts of yarn there. I love this color. I love bright, bold neons. I was talking to somebody recently about about colour, and I've, I've started to appreciate colour in a very, very different way since I've become a knitter. And I think it's because I deal with colour more, I'm thinking about colour, rather than just accepting that there's colour around me. I, and you look at the clothes that knitters wear, knitters tend to wear brighter colour clothes than non-knitters, that just seems to be a, a fact. And it's definitely happened to me, I appreciate colour in a way that I never used to, I used to take it for granted because it's just living its life around me, but now, or living my life around it. But now I seek out colour, and it's colours like this that really brighten my day. I love wearing, <laughs> he says wearing grey, I love wearing big, bold, bright colours. I really, really do. And I can't get enough. I really, really can't get enough. Just gorgeous. Um, and then, finally, this was the last game I bought, so it's kind of in chronological order. I, I went to the Miss Babs stall. Now, oh my goodness, Miss Babs stall, it was large, and for goodness sake, so, so popular. So popular. There was a massive queue of people waiting to pay for stuff at Miss Babs all day, both days. And I managed to find a time towards the end of the second day where I think a lot of people had already left for the day. Um, and heavens there were still five or six people waiting in line to, to buy before i got there but i found this one skein. there were there were so many that i liked this is definitely going to be a pair of socks this is their yummy two ply fingering yarn it's 100 percent superwash merino 365 meters 400 yards so it's not it's nothing special about the the, the yarn itself except the colors now don't laugh they're not the same as these <laughs> <laughs> this there's something about this it's the gray and the oranges it looks to me like rusting metal and there's the creamy colors and the yellows and golds and it just i think this is stunning i really really like this is ben's favorite of all the things i picked out as well uh and i knew i needed to have it it's 26 dollars um it's really beautiful and it I don't think this is going to be socks either, having just said what I said. Um, I think I was wearing a particular pair of trousers, striped corduroy trousers. I bought in San Francisco. I was wearing them both days in Rhinebeck. And they kind of went with my shawl a bit and they're, they're kind of loud and out there. And I really, really like them. I picked this off the shelf. And as I looked down at it, I saw past this down to the trousers I was wearing. I was like, I've clearly just picked up my trousers. <laughs> So actually, I want to wear something that I can wear with my trousers. So maybe some kind of kerchief type, uh, shawlette type thing, the, um, a lacy thing that I can use to show off these colors that will spread it out and then block it out to something bigger than it would normally be because it's, there's not a great deal of yardage here, but the colors are so gorgeous. Look at this section, this orange bleeding into the, the, the gray. It's stunning, stunning. So, 
when I put those things together, I can show you the hall, as a lot of people like to call it, myself included. Uh, hang on. Here we are. This is my Rhinebeck stash. <laughs> I didn't do too badly, did I? Uh, five of those, no, four of those were gifts, six of those things, five at Rhinebeck. Uh, I did all right. I've, I just need to get more time in my life for knitting all this wonderful yarn. Anyway, that's the stash enhancement. Let's move on because I've now got some knitting stuff to talk about. I don't want this podcast to go on forever. Um, let's talk about FOs first of all, because I've got one. Um, you'll remember, the Dragged Across America hat. Yeah, you've seen that. Last time you've also seen the two color version of it. There it is. Now this is three colors of the same uh, Quince & Co puffin yarn. We've got the dark gray, the uh, lighter gray, and the limeish green. So I had quite a lot of this left over, particularly the green, because I'd only used green for that section, and that section I had lots left over. I also, I'm on a kick at the moment, and this hat is part of it. One of the things I'm really keen to try and exploit in men's knitting particularly, is taking things that are generally seen to be the more feminine aspects of knitting and boying them up a bit and turning them into stuff that is suitable for men, or at least is completely gender neutral. This, for example, this hat is largely lace. And if I put it on, there ain't nothing girly about that hat. I, you know, and it's definitely, it's a lace texture. It's very, very open. You can see it absolutely is proper lace. But because it's done in a chunky yarn, it doesn't feel girly in any way, shape or form. Girls can wear that, but it doesn't feel girly. And I love that. I really, really love that. And I, one of the other things that I wanted to try and boy up a bit was beaded knitting. I've never done any beading before. I've always been fascinated by it, but it's all been so, it's usually these tiny little crystallized glass beads, which can be very beautiful on lacy things, but it's not been the kind of stuff that I've wanted to make, certainly not to wear. But I went to, I was in Tiger recently to buy something specific. I can't remember what I went in there for, anyway. And I happened to find a bag of beads. Big, chunky, chunky, see where this is going big, chunky wooden beads of a variety of colours. Lovely. This bag, this is what's left over, uh, cost me a pound from Tiger. And I made this cowl. I'm going to put it on. Now, I'm in love with this cowl. I'm absolutely in love with it. Can you see? It's the colours of these hats. So I could wear either of these hats interchangeably and it worked very nicely. But I've beaded the cowl in a sort of argyle pattern. And you see the diamond, the uh, that goes all the way around the cowl. And it's mostly the green here because that's the one I had most left over of from only that little section there. But it's also using the greys here and at the edges from this one color. It's bound off and cast on with a dark gray, a couple of rows of the other one, and then I'm into the green. And then I'm beading it, and for a bit of extra interest, I've put the contrasting strips around the center. This, this cowl, it's so, it was so easy to do. I knitted this in a 24 hour period, genuinely. It's on big chunky needles. It's got a lovely ribbed top and bottom, and beaded. But look at these beads. Some of them are huge and they're textural and they're, they're different shapes. We've got the square ones, we've got different sizes. We've got the littler beads here, um, which are really lovely and the very large, big ones here. And we've got the mahogany ones and the teak looking ones and the pine and the, and the paler ones. And, and basically it's just, <clears throat> I randomized it. I just picked out a bead at random. I knew where they were going because I had the pattern worked out in advance but this pattern i'm going to write this up very very quickly and i'm going to i'm going to rush this one out because uh it's going to be called disclosure 
uh, for reasons that I'll explain another time, because uh, I don't want to get on, <laughs> I haven't got time now. Um, so the Disclosure Cowl is, uh, it, because it's chunky and structural, and I think the beads help as well, it stands up really, really nicely, so it's great for winter wear. But because it's such a quick, chunky knit, this is going to be fantastic as a Christmas gift knit for somebody. Um, if you've got some, buy one colour of chunky and if you've got some scraps of another colour then that's fab um, then you can you, or you could make it all in one colour if you wanted to uh, but it's not a big time investment on this literally a 24 hour period and that's not 24 hours of knitting it's about four or five hours of knitting and I had this nailed and that's even with the, the beading these are beads that are not pre-threaded these are uh, worked in as you go using the crochet hook method just so that you know you could always do them in advance if you wanted to, but the way I've done them, um, each bead has a has a slip stitch going across the back, so it's locked in place. Uh, so it's, they're not going to they're not going to pop through. They, and so also that means that you're not going to be wearing those beads against your skin. You can sort of see little bits of it there, but it's not it doesn't feel like it's being worn on the skin. Um, my sister said, "Oh, I just I love it. So it looks brilliant." She said, but the uh, but the beads, I think, would get would become annoying. I said, no, put it on. You won't notice them. She said, oh, oh no, you don't. They just look great, and they do. And it and it it sort of holds its structure really, really well. And uh, it's really cozy and really, really warm. I'm a little bit in love with it, I have to say. So this is the disclosure cowl. I'm going to get this out very, very quickly. So watch this space. Uh, and for me. This is absolute boy beads. I t I've worn this a lot. I, I have no problem with it. And I've had so many comments on it. People just, oh, that's really unusual. That's really nice. Non-knitters, mostly. I uh, haven't really worn it around many knitters, but those who have seen it have really enjoyed it. And it just gives a little extra dimension to it. But it, for me, it allows beaded knitting to not be girly. Because again, it's sort of big and chunky. And I know that's sort of an easy ethos. Well, get the lace, make it chunky. Get the beads, make them chunky. And then you've got boy stuff. Well, that kind of works. And that, it certainly works for this boy knitter. So there we are, that's, that's the disclosure cowl. And uh, it'll be coming to a Ravelry store near you very soon indeed. Uh, and I've got all those left over. I could probably make another one. 48 beads in this, that's all, that's all you need. So anyway, uh, back to whips. Um, I haven't done a great deal more since you last saw it on this. It's still a whip, it's, there's, it's still coming. I've been a little bit sidetracked with other things and because I've got big magazine commissions on the go at the moment and some other deadlines that I'm working on, I, have, I, I think I'm gonna have to leave that for a little section. But there is the magazine commission I've been working on. Do you know, I'm not going to show you the project because I can't, I'm not allowed to, but I do want to show you a tiny little bit of the fabric just so you can see the sort of thing that's been keeping me busy. So if I tuck everything in so you can't see what it is even, but I show you a little bit of the fabric. <gasps> Look, stripes, <gasps> black and white stripes. Anyway, that has been keeping me up at night because it's been a nightmare to work out the engineering of what that project is. Um, and I'm getting there now, so I now need to know that's the project that whizzed by me. <laughs> Oopsie! That's the project I should have finished quite a long time ago and haven't done yet because it really has been keeping me up at night trying to get the maths right and trying to get the structure right for it. But I've done that now, so I'm now just sort of finishing off and writing up the pattern, send that off, great, but that's been taking up a lot of my time. Moving on from that uh, is a vanilla sock that I've shown you before. Now, do you remember the purple, green and uh, blue ones, kind of like these colours here? I'm not going to, I actually don't have it to hand. There's only about that much done of it. So that is a whip too. So I've been very, very busy with that. But the last thing I want to share with you is a new double knitted scarf. Now, unlike this one, which is all about the, the pattern and the, the sort of the chart, uh, and it's essentially just a rectangle. It is just a rectangle. Um, this one is also just a rectangle, but it's constructed in a very, very different manner. So rather than just uh, like drawing a pattern on a chart with like an Excel chart or something like that, this scarf uses increases and decreases, 
not to change the shape of the scarf, but to send columns of stitches in different directions. What does he mean? Well, let me show you. This is the scarf I'm working on at the moment. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. It's actually very, very easy to do. If you can see that center section, all the columns of stitches run diagonally between well, this, this horizontal panel and horizontal at the bottom, but in here in the middle, they all go up and down to the left and to the right. And then of course, being double knitted, on the reverse side, we have that effect. I think it's really, really elegant. Uh, it's also very simple to knit. I'm not gonna talk about it too much here, so I don't wanna give too much away. Because I have had in the past people kind of just taking what I've spoken about on the podcast and uh, and making their own version before I've had a chance to get the pattern out. Well, I can't do anything about that, but I can try and limit the information I give. Sorry about that. That's life, I guess. Some people spoil it for others. Um, but there we go. That's uh, that's what I'm working on. I really like it. It slightly biases because of the diagonal aspect of it, so it's not not an entirely flat rectangle. I don't think, when I, I may block it a little bit because I think it could do with just sort of flattening out just so you can really, really see the shapes that it's making. It's so geometric and so lovely. And this is knitted with, uh, this is Erica Knight British Blue. It's actually 100, it's 100 grams, but it's 100% pure British Blue Face Leicester. 220 meters DK weight for 240 yards, 100 grams. Um, it's so soft. It's lovely in the cake. Look at the shine on that. Really gorgeous. I've gone for sort of grey and mustard, or silver and gold, whatever you want to call it, or lead, really or dark. But it's got a real sheen to it that the BFL gives you, that uh, Merino doesn't ever give. Merino sort of takes the light, whereas this reflects the light. Um, it's also as BFL has, it's got a real uh, bounce to the texture to it. There's a structure to BFL that you don't get with Merino. And it's just, look at those directions. We've got up and down here and fully diagonal in the center and up and down. And if you see as well how uh, this panel of stitches, they get sent over here to join the diagonals and then they swerve across that other column there. So you get this sinuous continuation, uh, which and then this one rises out of the back of this one and in turn sweeps across and again, skews its way across those to become the next upright bar. It's, I'm so pleased with this pattern. I don't have a name for it yet. You're welcome to add suggestions. I may not choose a suggestion that you take, but I'll certainly take some suggestions. So if anyone wants to, general chatter thread, please. Uh, just pop over there, but I love this. It's grown quite quickly because it's DK weight, uh, it's, and it's not very many rows, uh, not many stitches per row, so it's quite a narrow scarf. So this one, I've got two skeins of each color. I think I will go to the second skein because I want it to be quite long, and I'll probably put a fringe on both ends as well but this is my new passion. There's so many things I need to be doing. This is the one I want to be doing. <laughs> and there we are, this is the new baby. I love it, I love it. And I love each and every one of you for sticking with me this long and listening to me burbling on about Rhinebeck. I'm essentially done, so I'm gonna sign off now. So while life, the, I can't even remember my own sign off, it's been such a while, so remember. <laughs> life is a work in progress we know this to be true but <laughs> now what do i normally say so while this podcast episode there we go back on track while this podcast episode really is a finished object uh, remember life is a work in progress just take it one stitch at a time yeah there we go i hope you've enjoyed me burbling on uh, and listening to me chat about this that and the other and seeing my Lovely Rhinebeck stash and the Polworth again. Uh, so I will see you in a couple of weeks and thank you for sticking with me. I look forward to chatting with you all at some point on some platform somewhere. Take care, happy knitting. Until next time, bye-bye.